definition uh, from fragmented in diversity to united in diversity, it's something that is quite uh, important from uh, a cybersecurity standpoint in the European Union. So there's a lot of knowledge, but it's very fragmented, and that's of course linked to the nature of the European Union and the division in 27 member states. In particular, a few years ago, a set of challenges has been identified by the European Commission, and a set of actions has been triggered before in the Horizon 2020 program, and then now in the Horizon Europe and Digital Europe program. So, first, definitely retain and develop essential capacities. Uh, that's quite a broad, uh, a broad challenge, but of course uh, the need to develop uh, technologies uh, and to keep the knowledge and to keep and maintain the knowledge uh, over these technologies. Alignment between cybersecurity research, competencies and investment, that's really, really important, of course, because uh, the academy can go into a direction, but then the industry needs to follow and the industry needs to push the academy on searching and, and researching on uh, some specific direction. So a good alignment is fundamental in order to improve our strategic autonomy in cybersecurity. Then, of course, uh, we have a need of investment and th this has been uh, cover at least partially by the new programs where uh, for cybersecurity there is much more money for research and innovation, especially in Horizon Europe and Digital Europe. And then, of course, uh, develop uh, <coughs> and master relevant cybersecurity technology. So not leave uh, specific technologies to other continent, to the USA, to China, etc., but try to master as much as possible with the European knowledge. And then uh, everything should be uh, tailored and should be directed for the production of new security products and services. So trying to limit the dependency that we have towards especially the United States, which is not too much a dependency in terms of knowledge, but is a strong dependency in terms of products and services. All of that uh, contributes to the concept of a European strategic autonomy, which is one of the main concepts that the European Commission is striving at in the past in the past year, especially from an IT and cybersecurity perspective. Um, so ECHO provides some answer to these uh, to these challenges in uh, in certain areas that I will briefly explore, including the prototypes that we work on. So the concept of uh, trying to limit uh, and to limit the dependency that we have uh, uh, with respect to other uh, to USA and China, etc., and trying to improve our strategic autonomy. So the main objectives uh, of ECHO is to create a network of cyber research and competence centers. Basically, to create a network of partners that can work together, that work together for uh, three years now, but we still have one year to go, in order to create, to do research and to create uh, technology. And uh, that's uh, slightly different from a normal uh, Horizon 2020 or even Horizon Europe program because the consortium is particularly large. And uh, so the complexity of managing together a lot of partners with different interests, but towards uh, a set of uh, Common, common main objective, of course, uh, was part of the of the challenge challenge itself, and uh, <clears throat> all of that uh, was to pilot. And Echo is not the only project that uh, performed this activity to pilot the future network of competence centers that the Commission is creating with the base in Bucharest and the set of national coordination center throughout all Europe in each member state. But this project and the other three twin projects. Uh, basically are the pilot for this future network that is being created. Then in the specifics, we work on a set of technologies. So we piloted the network, we pilot how to work together with a lot of partners from different member states, etc. But then we also work on a set of specific technologies. So the project in itself is composed originally by 30 partners. Now we are 44 partners, so it increased in size. And uh, the budget for ECO and for the other free twin projects is 16 million, so it's quite a large, uh, a large endeavor. And uh, uh, the project will we are already organizing ourselves to keep the network alive and to keep working uh, working together because at the end uh, it worked pretty pretty well. Of course, uh, all the partners are coming from a lot of different uh, uh, backgrounds, academies, research center, uh, small industries, mid-cap, large industries, etc. 
In terms of technology, we work on a set of things. So we work quite a lot on the governance model, the governance model for a network of center of competencies in cyber, which has been used by the commissions as inspiration to define the governance model for the future European network, if you want. We work on a multi-sector assessment framework, so a way to assess the risk in a multi-sector context. So what is the risk, for example, for a ship that is sailing and the GPS or the navigation system is act. So that's a classical multi-sector situation. And we develop a framework with a small tool that enables the calculation of the risk in this context. We work on cyber skill framework and training curricula. So basically we elaborated the cyber skill framework uh, with a way to derive training curriculum from the skills framework itself. And this work has been provided also to ENISA that use part of this work in order to publish the European cyber skill framework that has been out since one or two months, if I remember correctly. We work on cybersecurity certification scheme. So using the EU certification framework from ENISA, we extended it in order to tailor for sector specific certification of products. And then we work on a federated cyber range, so a way to federate together multiple cyber ranges to provide more complex exercises. And we work on an early, an eco, what we call eco early warning system. So a way to spread for hundreds of tenants to spread early warning information coming from incidents, CTI, etc., etc. So those are the main technologies that uh, that we worked on in in eco. But in reality, a good part of the project was also to define technology roadmaps. So technology roadmaps for uh, technologies relevant for EU, not only in the immediate next uh, three, four years, but also from now up to 10 years, to, 30, to, to 2030. So there was quite an extensive work on analyzing uh, uh, challenges and opportunities from a sector specific perspective and also from a multi-sector perspective in order to define possible technological roadmaps for new technologies that or they need to be reinforced with respect to some baseline that is already here or can be created from scratch. So that was quite a, a lot of research and development work, of course, but uh, it's quite an important part of, uh, of the activities that, uh, that we performed. And uh, starting from the technology roadmaps, we derived uh, a set of prototypes, which some of them you're going to see you're going to see today. So basically the prototypes are a sort of instantiation of, of some of these technology roadmaps that we defined within ECHO. As a reminder, we define the roadmaps by identifying challenges. So cybersecurity challenges without a direct solution from a technological perspective, then this triggered the definition of technology roadmaps. So there was quite, as I was saying, quite a lot of uh, um, extensive analysis. We examined a lot of reports uh, and we made a risk assessment over a specific multi-sector use cases and scenarios. And then we de defined the main challenges that we wanted to identify that you can see here within uh, within this slide and then from this uh, we decided to implement uh, some prototypes in order to at least uh, start solving these challenges and i think i'm gonna leave uh, the floor to antonis yes uh, thank you very much mateo uh, hey everyone, uh, this is Antonis Vulgaridis uh, from CERF. Uh, we've been leading the, the part of the intersector prototype uh, tools, uh, which is a task uh, uh, with a core objective uh, uh, to try to address uh, the most pressing uh, transversal and intersector cybersecurity challenges uh, that I identified in, the, uh, in other parts of the ECHO project. Uh, also trying to uh, develop these uh, solutions to, uh, in order to cover as much of uh, the priority areas and sectors as possible and uh, as a final goal uh, to increase the cybersecurity awareness towards this uh, process and in order to identify the most uh, let's say suitable technologies that we want to develop uh, we uh, analyzed uh, uh, all uh, all the relevant material and non functionalities and innovation factor that the, each of the proposed solutions uh, uh, provided and uh, we came up with a set of tools that uh, uh, are trying to address this uh, 
critical uh, challenges and also provide uh, 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 innovate, innovative solutions uh, based on uh, state-of-the-art tools and uh, techniques and methodologies uh, with the end goal, as I said, to increase the cybersecurity awareness uh, through several workshops, demonstrations and so on. So in the next slide, uh, I have... Uh, uh, yeah, thanks, Matteo. Uh, you can see that uh, at the end of the of, of the day, we selected 14 suitable tools uh, for uh, this uh, uh, development process. Uh, all these tools covered a variety of uh, challenges addressed uh, and also uh, are spanning uh, through multi domains and um, and, and multiple uh, priority areas. So we identified uh, uh, four sector specific prototypes and uh, uh, the rest the, 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 the rest of them uh, could uh, potentially cover multiple sectors so we can call them transversal. Uh, here in this slide you can also see that uh, uh, all these prototypes can be easily categorized in three main uh, uh, fields uh, uh, depending on where they stand in the uh, cybersecurity spectrum. Spectrum. So uh, we, we could identify them as uh, either red teaming tools, uh, be, uh, blue teaming tools, or purple teaming tools. Uh, where in the in, in the red teaming category we have the more attack oriented tools, in the blue teaming the more defense oriented tools, and in the purple the more uh, uh, information sharing and uh, across the board uh, uh, related tools. Uh, I, in the next couple of slides, uh, I have some uh, screenshots from the various tools and the UI that uh, they developed. So in this slide, you can see the uh, red teaming tools and specifically the penetration testing tool and the threat exposure calculator. Of course, the penetration testing tool uh, will be uh, in details uh, explained later in this workshop. In the next slide, we have uh, uh, the blue teaming ones uh, with uh, some more uh, uh, the purple team ones, um, I'm sorry, with some uh, information sharing uh, uh, tools uh, that are used in a variety of scenarios, let's say. And in the, in the, in the next slide, uh, we have uh, the blue team tools uh, with the more defense oriented tools uh, with, uh, um, let's say, technologies that uh, are assessing uh, some of the, of the factors that uh, a, a, an analyst can identify in its system. Uh, in the next uh, slide, uh, there is a summary of uh, uh, what uh, is about every one of these uh, identified and, and, uh, and developed tools. Uh, you can see that uh, we started uh, uh, nine uh, prototypes uh, from scratch, and uh, there were also five of them uh, of, of them that uh, were uh, uh, more mature when we began the we we began the project. And uh, uh, right now, all of them have reached uh, a, a really higher TRL and uh, can be used for several uh, demonstration activities and so on and so forth. Uh, in my last slide, um, I, I I will introduce a bit uh, what is the purpose of uh, of uh, the final purpose of uh, the prototypes. As I said, is to increase the cybersecurity awareness uh, through dedicated workshops uh, and demonstration cases. Uh, more specifically, we identified at the beginning of uh, ECHO project uh, five demonstration cases, uh, two of which, uh, 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 for two of which, uh, some of the uh, of the of the prototypes uh, will be participating in. Uh, more specifically, demonstration case number four, uh, where the uh, uh, the main focus will be the demonstration of uh, one. Of of uh, the, ec the ECHO main assets, as Matteo described, the feder federated cyber range uh, and uh, the demonstration case number four concept will be to support certification activities uh, for uh, ECHO projects and uh, products. And uh, for demo case number five, uh, five uh, four uh, prototypes will be participating in. Uh, so the, the core objective of the demonstration case is to showcase the capabilities of uh, ECHO assets, uh, to test thoroughly uh, uh, via extended scenarios all uh, uh, the prototypes uh, and the echo assets that are involved and of course to uh, by doing so to continue uh, research and develop uh, uh, all these uh, assets uh, these technology assets uh, that we came up with and uh, last but not least uh, the demonstration workshops uh, one of uh, which uh, we are uh, involved here today uh, the workshop cluster one uh, where uh, we actually uh, 
uh, identified some storylines uh, in order to show the functionality of uh, the developed tools, both as, as uh, standalone tools, but also in uh, uh, in uh, elaborated storylines, interconnecting the compatible prototypes with each other. And uh, of course, the main idea behind all of this is to also get uh, feedback uh, from uh, from you guys and from my uh, users uh, in order to improve and adapt uh, the whole process and uh, uh, the technologies and also share the visibility and of course, increase the, the awareness uh, related to cybersecurity fields. Uh, that's more about more or less about it. Matteo. Thanks a lot, Antonis. Yep. Yeah, I think we are uh, basically closing. Uh, just a couple of things to add. Um, we are uh, publishing in our website uh, some initial services that we would like as uh, as the conclusion of the project will will come to to provide to the public one of them is already active so if you are interested on uh, having some web crawling uh, on cybersecurity information um, we are we implemented an ai tool that basically searches the web and collects uh, relevant cybersecurity information it is in our in our website and in general if uh, I need to update this slide because we are 14 now new partners in general, if your organization may be interested on in entering uh, into ECHO, uh, absolutely have a look to the to the website. Uh, generally, the new participants that we are welcoming are interested on in some of the technologies on the research that we are doing within the project and uh, they are contributing uh, with the uh, the, the interest that they have. So, for example, we have uh, NG Laborelec, which is quite a large uh, research uh, uh, <coughs> laboratory within uh, a big uh, energy company in Belgium and in part of Europe. They are particularly interested on uh, the topics related to cyber ranges uh, and certification and several others. So if your organization is interested, uh, you can uh, go to our website and um, and have a look on how it works. It's a pretty simple uh, way to join, and then it depends on uh, on your interest if you, you want to do some specific research with us. And I think I'm done. So I would leave. Yeah, those are our social media. We have quite a lot of uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, YouTube, uh, website, etc. And uh, I would stop presenting and leave the floor to to the meat of the of the meeting. Uh, thank you very much, Matteo. Thank you very much, Antonis. It was a very, very quick and uh, uh, complete presentation. So we are going to leave the floor for the developers of uh, the CISP uh, prototype. Uh, CISP prototype uh, is um, um, an application which uh, is aiming of uh, simplifying the sharing data between partners and specifically it's been developed for the healthcare but i'm not i'm not saying any anything else because uh, you know the the owners or the prototypes are going to explain better than me uh, however i have for, for the audience uh, um, one question so let's say that we have uh, two doctors that are working for two different hospitals and uh, they want to share the data of a specific patient um, in order to improve, you know, to speed up the solution of the case. Do you think that in Europe we can do that easily or we do have to arrange some, uh, I don't know, tool or some uh, protocol in order to, to do it? Or we can just, uh, you know, print on paper, give to them to someone and then, okay, so this is available. I mean, do you uh, do do we have some rules in Europe that are forcing people not to share in data like uh, uh, like in every day? Or do you think that we can do it? Like uh, I can share my da the data of my patient to the first person that is passing by. Well, definitely we can't uh, with the GDPR, except okay. that it's a major problem. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, this if I is, get this sick, is... uh, if I'm Italian, I get sick in uh, in Greece. It can be a problem to get my my um, patient information from uh, from Italy. Okay. So and uh, again for the audience, uh, uh, do you think there, is, there are options to tackle this issue, or 
we have forced just to stay in the same hospital and we cannot share the data between two different institutions. So there is no way to do it or do you think we can we can do it somehow? Is there any way to do it in your opinion? OK, probably probably this uh, this idea is quite large, so it's not easy to to think in a few seconds. But fortunately, uh, the CISP guys thought about that, and so uh, they are going to to tell us how they thought to tackle this issue. So finally, I leave the floor to the uh, CISP presentation. And uh, so please share your screen and present. Thank you, Manai, Thank for you for the introduction. So uh, I am Peter Hegstrom and I'm here to present the CISP prototype um, that we had de developed as part of, of ECHO project um, uh, here at, at RIA. Um, let me start by, by going into uh, some of the challenges for, for healthcare. Emanuela already started to, to discuss this a bit in his questions, but we see increased mobility across uh, Europe uh, where people need to, to work in different countries, they travel more, uh, and this is basically a driven factor for, for this is the, the European single market, of course, and the demand uh, for, for foreigners to, to basically work across the entire continent. Uh, this drives a need for hospitals to not only change information, but also to collaborate and uh, and work across these borders. Uh, today, as we have seen it, it's very complex uh, to share data because of regulations, uh, but also existing initiatives um, are complicated and uh, requires a lot of manual steps and um, specific case-to-case -case, um, judgment which sometimes leads to hospital exchanging data in less secure ways for instance by using secure uh, for instance by physical media or fax or even email um, also from from the uk there has been reports where whatsapp has been used for for exchange of healthcare data uh, and of course that is problematic with gdpr but also uh, for other healthcare regulations so the healthcare needs to be able to, to do this uh, in case of unplanned and planned events. Um, for instance, when you're transferring patients uh, between hospitals, but also in cases where you have emergencies uh, abroad. Um, we need to be compliant to the regulations and integrate into the existing healthcare infrastructure, or else it's not possible to, to have a structure exchange. And the data that we are exchanging needs to be secure uh, and correct, uh, which means that you can trust the data that you're receiving um, and you can, can act on it. And any solutions that we are, are proposing needs to be more flexible than the less secure alternatives or else uh, healthcare personnel will fall back to, to less secure mechanisms. The secure information sharing platform is our response to this kind of challenge. Uh, this provides a web-based multi-tenant federated system uh, which allows hospitals to exchange patient data and collaborate between uh, between organizations in, in this uh, including cross-border cases uh, the concept is based around ticketing where we can create uh, joint tickets where then the hospital uh, personnel can, can work on this and exchange and collaborate uh, in predefined user uh, formats. To create um, trust between different organizations, um, we need to have some kind of mechanism to um, put them into to, to clusters. So what we do is that we, we provide a model called constituencies. Inside the constituents, you can share data, but you can only share data with members of the constituents. Um, so this enables us to create overlapping or completely disjunct um, uh, constituencies with organization uh, where you already have pre-agreed 
um, uh, rules for how you share data, in which format you share, uh, how you identify uh, patients, etc. Um, and this basically forms the, 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 the circle of trust in, in which uh, you can safely exchange that data. Hospital also have a need to control where the data is because of, of regulations. Uh, so they want to be in control which data leaves their system. In the case of CISP, we provide both a multi-tenant system, but also a federation of different instances of the platform. Then the, the, the different instances can communicate over trusted channels using uh, a messaging protocol and peer-to-peer -peer networking. These different connections are then um, then um, added security on top of um, by using uh, TLS channels and bidirectional certificates, where we can form a chain of trust uh, back to a single certificate authority. The system is also capable to cope with uh, with partition partitioning over networks, meaning that you might have uh, a failure on outage, a temporary failure or, or outage over a network connection, and then uh, you can still uh, continue your operations of the system. And as soon as the link is restored, the system will be eventually consistent again. Uh, in order to, to, to make this happen, we are relying on, on a mechanism of um, uh, eventual consistency, as previously mentioned, but also we have something uh, which allows us to control that we have no versioning conflicts in a di distributed system called vector clocks. This bit itself is built on, on tickets, as I previously mentioned. In order to model uh, the needs for hospital organizations, we have a templating system that allows us to build different workflows that are native to the health organization. We have a set of different attributes that allows us to um, uh, share uh, tickets in a, in a standardized way. And then we have a set of attributes that we can add uh, to the templates and configure based on, on the needs for the exchange. Um, and then we also have groups of attributes that we can configure for, for, for the templates, allowing us to add uh, multiple instances of the same information in a structured way. The synchronization mechanism um, is based on, on messaging uh, using the advanced messaging queuing protocol. Uh, we are leveraging uh, RevitMQ to, to make this happen, which provides a persistent and reliable messaging between the different nodes. Um, this allows us to ensure that messages are delivered as soon as possible and over secure channels using these uh, bidirectional certificates and uh, TLS. Uh, the way it works is that we, we, we provide a mechanism to add um, messages to an outlet, which is then consumed by an inlet on a different instance. In this way, uh, the, the servers basically are, are not connected directly, and we do not have to have these persistent connections, but it allows us for, for more um, failure resistance, etc. The system is a multi-tiered web system uh, built on the Spring Boot framework together with a web, uh, rich web client, uh, which is an Angular application. Um, between the, the different nodes, as previously mentioned, we are using AMQPS for, for the synchronization and, and reliable messaging. Uh, then the system also provides content extractions uh, from binary files, uh, which means that if you upload a, a PDF document, we can index that as free text in our database for efficient search, etc. If you're interested to learn more about the CISP, uh, you can reach out to the RIA group at our web page, where we have a con contact us page and, and uh, uh, provide a query there. If there are any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any questions. So, Peter, you were very clear, I guess. So, we can go on then with uh, 
the next uh, presentation. Here the outline again, just to recall where we are. So the, post the, the following presentation is the pen test, uh, which stands for penetration testing tool. Uh, before leaving the stage to the owner of the, these prototypes, I want to ask again to the audience um, if they have already somehow um, tested the, uh, the reliability of a product in terms of cybersecurity, maybe through a, a penetration testing tool, maybe the, the common one that are available online, the simple one, or maybe some complex one that you have developed by yourself. So if someone you did, maybe you can share your, uh, your experience with us. Okay, I don't see any hands, so probably uh, it's better to going on with the presentation. So I leave the stage to uh, Antonis, I guess, for the presentation of uh, of the penetration testing tool. Uh, yes, it's Mike, basically. Uh, thank you. Ah, okay. And, uh, may I see my screen? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, do it. Okay. So, uh, let me start. So, <clears throat> okay. So, hello everyone, I'm Mike Anastasiadis and I'm going to present you the penetration testing tool, which was developed by Seth's uh, VagLab team for the needs of uh, the ECO project. First of all, the tool is inspired by the OpenVAS and Nessus tool. The prototype provides a semi-automated process of scanning vulnerability identification and validation by actively exploiting the vulnerable machine. The tool is already integrated in a game virtual machine in order to be used by an attacker in EFSEC demo cases. Furthermore, the prototype can be either used on cybersecurity exercises or by IT specialists to investigate possible threats in their internal network and their web applications. Finally, a ticket functionality is provided in the reporting phase, giving the opportunity to the IT specialist to share the identified threats and vulnerabilities in the ECHO Erlgoing system. So, what is uh, the penetration testing tool? Uh, the penetration testing tool is a remote security scanning tool which scans a computer and raises an alert if it discovers any vulnerabilities that uh, hackers could use to gain access to the computer. Who would use a tool like this? A system administrator or even a developer in order to secure their computers and applications, keeping them free from common vulnerabilities that a malicious threat actor could use to exploit. What the penetration testing tool is not. The penetration, to the penetration testing tool is not a complete security solution, rather, rather than a good security strategy that prevents attacks by actively attacking the system and find vulnerabilities that could eventually be exploited. Why to use uh, the penetration tool? The penetration tool, tool offers a semi-automated type of scan. It scans for open port service and vulnerabilities on web application. It generates a report in only to five uh, to ten minutes, and because of course uh, because it's cool. In here we have some features of the tool. Uh, some of them are the local area network discovery, the port scanning, the vulnerability scanning, the information gathering, the vulnerability validation and exploitation, and finally the detection report. On the right side, as uh, we can see, we have the high-level architecture of the tool. The, to the tool only leads an IP address or a host name of the machine that you want to attack. The port uh, scanner identifies uh, open port services and using the results of the scan, the fingerprinting and uh, the web exploitation phase are running. And finally, the tool generates the overload a vulnerability report. In here, you have some challenges covered by the tool. Some of them are the attribution of cyber attacks, the content management system hacking, the unauthorized access, the SQL injection, the cross site scripting, and uh, the cross site request forgery. Finally, some innovation points of the tool. The tool is a quick solution for detecting low hanging fruits in local networks for the initial reconnaissance phase. It has extendable capabilities. Right now, the tool supports up to six fingerprinters, but you can easily add the fingerprinter for a specific service for your needs. It is very friendly to non-expert users. For example, a developer with almost zero knowledge in cybersecurity can use the tool in order to identify vulnerabilities in the developed web applications. 
It generates uh, very comprehensive reports. Furthermore, it is very easy to deploy. Right now, we have two deployment options. You can either deploy it as a virtual machine or as a, or as, as a Docker container. And finally, someone can easily serve the generated security reports of the tool through uh, the early warning system. And uh, yes, that's it. This was a brief introduction of uh, the penetration testing tool. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, I'm happy to answer. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, my colleagues said many terms that are probably not easy to understand, like fingerprints and uh, stuff that uh, I had to ask by myself uh, uh, the yes. first time uh, I saw the presentation, but later, uh, while uh, he is going to show us the demo, most of those terms are going to be clear. But I yes, see exactly. there is uh, um, there is a, a raised hand, so please, I don't, I cannot really see you. So speak um, up. hi everybody, um, I have a, a question. Uh, what happened uh, when a uh, service a demo? like a socket secure shell uh, not running on uh, 23 port, for example. Because uh, some uh, services, some uh, daemons, uh, they don't run on usual ports. For example, socket secure shell. And many times these uh, services uh, doesn't run on uh, yes. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, basically, we provide uh, to the user to scan all ports or a port range or a single port according to their needs in order to identify the open ports and services and then to move on on, uh, uh, on more uh, in reconnaissance phase. Uh, also, uh, the, in the figure reading phase, uh, we simply a brute force uh, with the logging credentials uh, in uh, some of the services. Right now, we are supporting up to six uh, services. So if uh, if the service that you want to attack is on these six services, then you probably ca uh, can, attack it, can attack it with uh, the fingerprint index. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, regarding uh, web fingerprint, uh, do you refer, uh, for example, uh, to take information about uh, web uh, services? For example, uh, if it's, it's running in Jinx or uh, yes. Apache with uh, yes. server-side um, software. In general, uh, from uh, web server file configuration, if you hardening this uh, file, it's uh, very difficult to get uh, information about uh, what kind of uh, web server uh, exists, for example, at distance. And second, for uh, server side language, for example, in PHP language, uh, it's also um, hardening this file and uh, no errors appear on the uh, web page, uh, no information regarding uh, what kind of uh, server side uh, language are running at distance. Uh, it's difficult, uh, in my opinion, to get information regarding uh, web uh, servers and uh, uh, much more valuable information is regarding which framework, which uh, software, Da? For example, it's running uh, WordPress or Drupal or a yes. different content management system or Laravel. Or, uh... Yes, exactly. That's why we provide on the web exploitation phase, we provide uh, two scanners, one for web applications like uh, uh, written on Angular or React and one for content management systems like uh, Joomla and WordPress. And someone can select uh, either of them or both of them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, 
So we, I guess we are ready for the next presentation, which is uh, uh, SNORT. SNORT uh, is probably known uh, by the major of the people involved in uh, cybersecurity. Uh, here we are going to present some plugins uh, starting from SNORT, uh, and so I leave the stage to Marcin. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, you um, see uh, my presentation regarding uh, the third um, prototype. Um, good morning, everyone. <laughs> First of all, uh, my name is Martin Niemiec, uh, and I want to present you um, functionality, maybe not functionality, but general idea regarding uh, uh, the SNORT module. Uh, SNORT module, uh, it's a prototype developed by uh, AGH team uh, and in general it's intrusion uh, detection system. However, um, before I present uh, how this uh, tool is working um, I want to uh, I want to, probably you can ask me uh, why developing another uh, another intrusion detection system we know uh, a few such solutions which which uh, which are easy to deploy um, uh, in the practical network uh, the answer is very simple uh, unfortunately, intrusion detection is still a challenge in practice. Um, we don't, we still, we, we still don't have the perfect solution which uh, is able to detect uh, all um, practical attacks. Um, in general, we have uh, right now we have uh, two approaches regarding uh, to attack detection. Uh, the first is uh, rule-based uh, intrusion detection, uh, when we are uh, matching uh, the current traffic into the um, signatures of attacks. Uh, however, um, it's not very scalable approach, and uh, there is a risk of um, zero-day attacks because when we, if we don't have uh, signature of a, a given attack, uh, we can't uh, detect uh, this, uh, this attack. Uh, another solution is anomaly-based uh, intrusion detection. Um, however, it's very difficult to say what uh, anomaly really is. So it's difficult to personalize uh, this, uh, these tools. Uh, and of course, it gener generate a lot of false, uh, false positives. That's why uh, we want, we uh, decided to to go into the uh, in in the middle path uh, of both of these uh, approaches and uh, take advantages uh, of each uh, approach. Um, the prototype uh, Snort module, uh, as I said, it's intrusion detection system. Um, however, of course, uh, of course, uh, uh, it's not just a Snort environment, but it's it, it is based on the SNORT environment, however, contains extended functionality of SNORT. Uh, this functions, functionality is heuristic approach to intrusion detections. Um, heuristic approach based on external data. So based on, um, based on um, external data shared by um, another, another entities. Um, on the right, um, uh, in the right uh, side, uh, you see uh, the uh, general uh, architecture of uh, SNORT. It's uh, architecture in uh, SNORT uh, 2.9 version. Um, and uh, here you see uh, the preprocessor modules. The preprocessors pre allows us to implement new functionalities, and that's why uh, we um, we uh, implemented uh, or extended uh, functionality there. Uh, in, um, however, right now uh, there is also Snort version 3, and uh, here we have uh, inspectors like plugins. Uh, uh, so, so these two uh, architectures are a bit, uh, a bit, a bit different, uh, but we implemented our Snort model if bo in both uh, architectures. Uh, okay. Uh, so what is uh, what is um, the the crucial uh, issue regarding to to this model? Uh, we believe that joint approach to attack detection uh, is more effective than individual approach. Uh, what does it mean? Um, 
joint approach. That means uh, if we have federation of entities or if, if we have uh, um, some entities uh, in the given sector, uh, we can share data, we can share threat intelligence and, uh, um, and uh, develop uh, the more effective uh, intrusion detection. Um, each uh, each attacks uh, can be described by uh, by some group of we called it flags the group of uh, uh, features. Uh, so we um, proposed a five uh, we proposed five uh, different flags which is uh, which describe the nature of the threat. Uh, of course, the severity of of the threat. Uh, uh, we have some some levels like uh, critical, medium, uh, or or low. Uh, also, the type type of attack because um, different types of attacks uh, uh, um, influence in the different way to to the uh, to the to the um, uh, to their given ser uh, server. Uh, the range uh, that. That means the impact of resources can be different. Uh, also, um, some type of attacks requires activity by end user. Some some kind of attacks not. Uh, also, availability. Uh, that means uh, can be uh, can impact uh, uh, on availability of parts of uh, of network or just uh, entire network. And. Uh, the the last thing is uh, entropy value. Uh, entropy value is not a, a um, ordinary flux, but can uh, it's a very uh, very interesting approach uh, can uh, which help uh, to um, to detect uh, distributed of Daniel uh, service uh, attacks. So we can group. Uh, this um, this uh, different uh, flags um, put to the to the one place and um, and try to uh, try to detect uh, attacks in practice. Uh, how it's uh, working? So um, multivariable heuristic detection um, is based on the uh, as I said is based on the flags. Uh, the flags uh, influence to the uh, current packet value. Uh, each packet at the beginning have um, a such value, and we uh, check if uh, after that, after the um, uh, the calculation, uh, the current value of each packet um, is uh, is under the threshold or not. Uh, also, we uh, can check um, the global entropy value uh, to detect uh, in the better way. Um, such attacks like um, distributed Daniel of service. Uh, why? Because entropy um, give us uh, information uh, about uh, possibilities of uh, each uh, of each um, random variable. Uh, this random variable can be IP address. So when we uh, have the, the the huge attack di distributed of the uh, of uh, distributed of Daniel, Daniel of service attack, uh, the entropy will be will be quite high. Uh, so uh, so we can um, so we can detect this kind of attack. Um, what about uh, the verification of this uh, this tool? Of course, during the development, we um, we done a lot of uh, a lot of tests. Uh, however, uh, what is important and um, this tool is using um, for um, scientific purposes, uh, for example, uh, we um, there was um, there was some test related to um, detect uh, detect uh, number to to say uh, how um, the function uh, how the efficiency of uh, this heuristic approach uh, influence to uh, influence to um, mm, uh, duration of the scanning. That's mean. Um, that's mean uh, how uh, uh, how how long the, the each iteration uh, should be to detect attack in the higher uh, rates. So so this uh, this uh, tool is, is is we believe it's powerful for 
um, for research purposes. Uh, if you want to um, know uh, more about uh, multi-heuristic uh, approach to intrusion detection, um, it's worth to uh, it's worth to uh, see to um, the first article uh, which is uh, put in this uh, in this slide. Um, how, uh, we also presented uh, uh, more technical informations uh, in the uh, to other uh, to other uh, conference um, uh, papers. Um, thank you very much uh, for listening. Um, maybe, of course, I can uh, answer your questions. However, uh, I believe that uh, a lot of answers uh, will be. Um, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of questions uh, will be uh, uh, maybe later uh, after after a practical demo uh, because uh, we show you uh, some functionality related to uh, to this tool. Uh, however, of course, I can answer answer now or you can put uh, into the chat uh, box um, some some simple simple questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin, for the presentation. It was, uh, let's say, quite complex because, of course, you show all the math behind. Um, actually, this uh, gives me the opportunity to remark one fact. So if you look for those concepts we just presented today on Internet, you will definitely find something. But what we are doing here is uh, creating stuff that are, uh, generally speaking, uh, useful for everyone, not just for people that are expert in cybersecurity. So the demos are going to show you uh, exactly what I mean, because uh, um, most of the tools are very intuitive, easy to use, uh, and with, uh, let's say, quite a simple manuals, you can, you can use them. And also, as Martin has again explained in the end, uh, when he talked about the multi-heuristic, the multi-heuristic is an approach to speed up the process of uh, detecting something because you know as the attackers are getting faster we have to be faster in defending so uh those are the reason why uh, we are developing something that maybe are already known uh in the world but let's say that our our um, prototypes are in a sense better because they are faster they are more intuitive they are easier to use those are the things that we are trying to to do so um i share if there are no questions more, I share one second again the timeline. OK, so you see that now we are going to see the demo of CISP, then the pen test and finally this node. So I leave you, I leave the screen uh, to the CISP demo. So please share your screen, Peter. Thank you. So I will not have time to go uh, through everything in the application, but I will give a, a bit of a highlight uh, of the tool itself. Uh, so what you're seeing right now is the, the first screen of, of SISP where you log in. Uh, one particular thing to take note of here is that we um, have, have a multi-tenant system in this case, uh, so we can log in using different organizations. Uh, I'm going to log in as the General Hospital of Heraklum, which is a real hospital in Greece, uh, but we have simulated all the data inside the platform um, to, to just give a sense of, of what kind of data we are dealing with and, and what we can do with the tool. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm logging in as a doctor. And then we are presented the main screen of, of the CISP application. As I mentioned during my presentation, it's possible to exchange these different tickets between uh, different organizations. Inside this, we have a constituents with, um, we have multiple constituencies, but I'm going to make the exchange with uh, a simulated hospital in, in Italy called uh, Policlinico Gemelli. Um, uh, on the left side, we can see the different main functions we have. Uh, I am now at our main dashboard. We can also see that we have organized this into MRI tickets and dialysis assistance requests. Um, and further, we have some more functionality that I'm not going to show. Uh, what the system allows us to do is to create a new ticket to record the information that we have about the current thing that we 
uh, want to exchange or record uh, for ourselves. So in this case, I'm going to choose uh, from the different templates that I have. Uh, in this case, I only have the magnetic resonant imaging requests. I can decide which kind of distribution this should have. So I'm going to just choose red, which means it's only for invited participants. Um, and the template basically allows us then to record different, different fields. Uh, so that's what we are seeing on this current screen. So you can see that we have a few attributes that are, are specific to the magnetic uh, image uh, template. I'm not really familiar with what 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 kind of data the hospitals are recording, um, but this is just to give a give a sense of what what we can do with it. Further, we have the possibility to add different facets. Uh, in this case, we had something called patient identification that I'm going to add to this ticket to describe. Um, the, the the patient I am, am creating this ticket about. if I'm missing some information. Yes. So on the participant side, we can define who has access to this particular uh, ticket. We can also assign uh, an internal handler for this one. So I'm going to assign this to myself. And then we have the groups. And the groups allows us to create very, very small circles of, um, of users. Um, and the groups are also uh, hierarchical. So what we can do is we can have a specific uh, department that we we create as a specific group that inherits a larger unit, maybe, uh, which in, then inherits the complete organization. And this allows us then to 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 very precisely tell where this information is going into my organization, so I can limit the distribution and the visibility of the data that I have created, while still allowing uh, my fellow doctors in my hospital to share this data and work on it together. In this case, I only have the group doctors. So I'm going to assign that. After I have created my my ticket, it's then possible to work with it in workflows. So in this case, we have a very, very simple workflow, but depending on, on the process that we're following, uh, we can have a much more complicated workflow that is, is also defined by the, by the ticket template. Um, Inside, we have the possibility to attach medical files. Uh, for instance, we could uh, attach a diacom file. If this is a, a result from, from a medical examination, for instance. Um, a diacom file is basically a structured data format that is, that is produced by x-rays, um, machines, etc., cetera, um, which then is, is possible to transfer as part of this ticket. You can also attach um, uh, CDA reports, et cetera, which is another kind of clinical document uh, that, that is produced from, from different healthcare systems. And we have the possibility to then, then enrich this with comments uh, as well as more attachments. What's really interesting with the platform, though, is the, the sharing capability. So what I'm going to do here is to uh, say that I want to share this with a different hospital. You can see that a few things have then turned over and became blue. The blue fields are what is always shared. That's part of the, the basic information that we need to keep in order to be able to, to display them and list, et cetera. So we keep the, the information about the current state, what distribution it is in, um, its title and description. And then on the right side, we can see that we now also have something called constituents and shared with and who shared this. Uh, this uh, allows me then to select which 
trust circle I'm going to exchange this ticket in. Uh, for this specific case, I will exchange it with um, FPG. So this is a kind of a bilateral uh, sharing constituents between uh, the Seven Health region of Crete and uh, Gemelli in Italy. So what I can do here is I can say that I want to exchange this with Gemelli by selecting them. Um, we also have then um, uh, the possibility to include information very specifically. So maybe we don't want to share everything we have about our patient, but we need to exchange some information. But before we do uh, share this ticket, the system allows us to redact and ensure that only the information needed to fulfill the request is getting shared. Um, so we need to have some kind of patient identification. But for instance, maybe we don't want to send which examination this is because it might be sensitive or we might have other information kept inside uh, this ticket that we do not want to, to include as, as part of the sharing. Uh, when I've done so, I can then save and share this. As part of the GDPR process, uh, the system then queries you to ensure that you have followed the GDPR process and asked for consent from the user. Um, when we talk to different hospitals about this, they said that it needs to be part of a larger uh, application flow that they have Mainly that flow is on paper, as I understood it, and that's why uh, the forms are not handled inside the system, but it's out of context for, for the system. So in this case, we can we can only ask the doctor to ensure that he has, has performed the necessary steps. After I have now created this, uh, this ticket is then shared with FPG and they can uh, update this and work with this, attach more information to it. Uh, and when when it's done, they can then um, choose how to, to proceed with it in their own organization. That's the basic uh, part um, of the application that I wanted to show you uh, to just uh, demonstrate the, the, the sharing capability of this. Thanks so much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm more than, than happy to answer. Thank you, Peter. I guess uh, it was very, very clear. The the interface is very understandable in my opinion. So probably now no no question just for that. Uh, one thing that I want to remark, probably Peter, you told, but uh, I had some luck in communication. So all the data you saw today are um, artificial. So we are not exposing, of course, the data of anyone. The, the hospital is a real one, but everything is on local server, so it's a reproduction of uh, a real system, just for the sake of the presentation, of course. So thank you, thank you, for you Peter. Yeah. Thank you so much. So uh, I guess uh, we can go on with uh, the second uh, demo, that is the pen test. Uh, as uh, my colleague mentioned before, it is basically the uh, um, and a penetration testing tool that is going to attack a server. So I leave you the stage to you and uh, thank you very much in advance for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, uh, can you show my screen? Yes. I hope. Okay. So, uh, so right now, uh, for the needs of this scenario, the penetration testing tool is running on a virtual machine and it's connected uh, through the MIS platform uh, through a VPN server. The tool, as we can see, has uh, six tabs. In the first, uh, in the first net discover tab, the tool gives the ability to the user to scan the local area network in order to identify the neighbor machines. Right now, because we are connecting uh, with the CISP instance through a VPN server, this tab cannot identify neighbor machine. Although I deployed some virtual machines, as you can see, uh, on my local network for presentation purposes. So uh, if we scan uh, the local area network, we will see uh, that the tool identified uh, these two neighbors. And if we go to these two IPs, we will see that they're responding and they are the, the virtual machines. So we can use uh, these IPs in order to attack on uh, the following tabs. 
Next, on the scanning tab, someone can use it in order to attack a host and identify open ports and vulnerable services. We provide uh, three options. Uh, someone can attack an IP address, an IP range, or a host name. Uh, someone can attack a single port, a port range, all or all ports of the host. We provide uh, up to five uh, type of scans, with the most common to be being the simple scan, the service scan, and the script scan. If someone chooses uh, choose the script scan, is able from here to choose a script in order to find vulnerabilities, in order to find basically vulnerabilities for the specific version of uh, uh, the open ports. We provide also up to six uh, a timeout exhaustion modes. And uh, using the results of the tool, a uh, user is able to run the fingerprinting scripts uh, using the results of, uh, of the scan and the web exploitation scripts. And uh, now we will perform a simple attack on the Sys platform by also using the fingerprinting and the web exploitation uh, scripts from here. So uh, let me take uh, the name of this platform. I will select a, sim a small port range, basically in order to uh, in order to have a, a very fast scan. Uh, I will uh, from the scan types. I will uh, select the simple scan, the service scan, and the script scan. Because we use the script scan, we are able to use also one of these two scripts. Um, I will use uh, the full scan. Uh, on the timeout exhaustion mode, I will select the normal mode. Then, using the output of the scan, I will uh, uh, I will select to run the fingerprinting scripts. As you can see, we have here some uh, default work lists. I will select the most uh, widely used, the work list, uh, which has uh, many works. And uh, all, I also uh, select the web, the, the web exploitation scripts. Uh, before execute, basically allow me to refresh the connection with uh, the VPN server in order to avoid any connection errors. Okay, uh, the CISP server is responding and I will execute the attack. So uh, while we wait for the tool to perform the attack and generate the report, uh, let me show you the following tabs. As I said before, the fingerprints can be either run using the output of uh, the scan or individual by here. We provide up to six fingerprints, as you can see. Uh, you can select uh, uh, as many as you want, from, of course. Uh, in here, you can write the IP of the host that you want to attack. And in here, you can select the work list, uh, uh, one of these work lists. But of course, if someone wants to upload a specific work list for their needs, he can go in here and upload his, uh, his work list. And of course, it will be shown in here and uh, he can select it. And next, on the next tab, we have the web exploiters. As I said before in the presentation, we provide two web exploiters, one for web applications like uh, uh, developed on uh, Angular and React, and the second one for content management systems like Joomla and WordPress. Of course, in here you can write uh, the, the host that you want to attack and the, the attack port that uh, the web application is around. Finally, we have uh, the report tab. As you can see, the report tab consists of uh, four columns. On the first column, we have the IP of uh, the host that we attack. On the second, we have the actions, uh, what type of attack we made, the timestamp. And on the last column, on the report uh, column, we have two buttons, one with the results, which is uh, the report uh, button, and uh, the, a second one with the create ticket, which creates a ticket on the early warning system. Uh, this is more or less uh, the platform. Uh, while we waiting, while we waiting to for the scan to finish, allow me to also point that uh, the figure printers basically brute force uh, the logging uh, with the logging credentials. Uh, these six services, as you saw in here, in order to find uh, uh, the correct ones and then give them on the report phase. And uh, yes, that's more or less all uh, the platform. And uh, yes, I think it's, uh, it's finishing.
if someone has some questions right now, we can, since we are waiting, we can ask uh, uh, yes, of course. whatever we want. So uh, actually, I have a question. Oh, yes. Uh, okay, it's finished. Okay. So okay. Go yes. The presentation. We go. Yes, again. exactly. Uh, so if we go to the report tab, we will see that this was uh, our scan. We used the scanning, the finger pickings, and the exploiters, as I said before. If we go on the report uh, tab, uh, allow me to first uh, start from the scanning results. As we can see here, we have. Uh, the tool identified four open ports along with their services. And because uh, we use the full scan script for each one of uh, the open ports, uh, some vulnerabilities uh, are suggested to the user in order to test them, as you can see. Next, uh, if, we go, uh, if we go to the fingerprinting results, we will see that the tool identified the correct credentials for the SSH service. And uh, Lastly, on the web exploiters results, as you can see, because uh, the Sys platform was not written on uh, a content management system like Joomla or uh, WordPress, uh, this scanner didn't identify anything. Uh, but if we go on the web application scanner, you will see that uh, we have many alerts for developer or security analysts to test for the platform. So uh, this was uh, basically uh, the tool. This was a simple scan uh, along with uh, uh, the fingerprint center of exploitation scripts to run all together. Uh, the tool provides a semi-automated type of scan in, order, in under two, five to ten minutes. Uh, allow me in here to point out that uh, this does not mean that this is platform is vulnerable. The tool simply suggests some related vulnerabilities to services where a developer can use can use them to check the security of the of the platform, of course. So uh, thank you for your attention. Of course, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. OK, I guess uh, there are no questions. It was uh, actually clear to me, I guess uh, clear basically to everyone. Of course, there are some terms that are probably not that uh, well known to anyone. I learned personally a lot, even though I work in cybersecurity. Uh, I just want to uh, stress one thing. Uh, of course, uh, those tools are meant to be used by persons that uh, are working with cybersecurity, but the thing is, uh, this uh, tool here is uh, giving a very range uh, set of activities to test your server, to test your application. So basically, uh, you have the opportunity to have uh, many tools in one, and also, exactly. even though you are not very skillful uh, in uh, all of those, uh, here you have a very uh, um, user-friendly uh, interface, which is all even explain you. Uh, can you show me uh, back again the report? Uh, you the fingerprints result, I guess. It uh, was in which uh, uh, in which it was uh, at the little. No, probably not. Um, uh, in here, I think. Yeah, exactly. You see that everything is well explained. These are arranged, so it's very easy to navigate through yes, the results exactly. of the tool. So that's one of the main, in my opinion, one of the main aspects. Of course, and there are the, many. Please, please. And, and that was the initial point uh, when we started to develop it, to provide a simple tool for developers and IT specialists with uh, some uh, with a small knowledge of for cyber security to test uh, their products and uh, their web applications. Nice. So uh, if you, there are no questions, I would go on with the last uh, uh, demo. So this not uh, this not demo which is uh, related with the pen test activity, because basically what we are doing is attacking with the pen test, and so this north is uh, detecting this, uh, this activity. But I leave the, the microphone to Marcin, so go on Marcin. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Uh, 
Um, I remember your comment, your suggestion, uh, less math, more practice. So I try to avoid, uh, tire you with mathematics and present some, uh, some uh, practical issues related to SNORT model. Um, at the beginning, uh, do you see the command line? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, um, if you are familiar with Snort, uh, um, my explanation um, will be will be quite easy. However, I want to uh, I want to mention about some basic re basics related to uh, to Snort environment. So, at the beginning, um, it's it's important to uh, to show um, configuration uh, configuration. Uh, file. Uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, let's see to um, to configuration file. Uh, here it is. Uh, and um, in fact, it's uh, it's general configuration uh, file. Um, however, uh, here you see the heuristic uh, functionality uh, regarding to uh, re regarding to plugin supporting multivariable heuristic detection. Uh, if you remember my uh, last presentation, I said that. Uh, uh, the crucial thing is to uh, check if uh, a um, given packet is under or below the thre threshold. So at the beginning, uh, we need to uh, define the, the threshold sensitivity. For example, uh, we can modify it. Um, it's, uh, it will be 18.5. Uh, and of course, uh, the initial packet value. So of course, the initial packet value must be higher uh, because uh, after the heuristic detection, we need to consider um, some flags uh, and, uh, and then uh, check the final um, value of each packet. Uh, also, we have here the maximum entropy. Uh, so it's the global entropy um, used, for example, to detect distribution um, Daniel of service attacks. And the last thing, um, the last thing is uh, the path to malicious IP addresses. This is a list of malicious IP addresses, uh, which uh, which was uh, which was. Uh, uh, um, produce it using um, uh, in the in the federation or um, or for example from uh, uh, take it from another uh, entity uh, in the same sector. Uh, so uh, let's see uh, to the uh, to this file. Uh, this is uh, this is the malicious IP addresses file, and here we have a lot of uh, a lot of IP addresses. Um, each line uh, indicates the um, uh, malicious IP address um, and uh, a lot uh, and uh, three, th uh, five uh, kind of flags, uh, uh, which I which I mentioned uh, before, and also the entropy entropy value. Okay, so at the beginning, I think uh, this is this is all. So let's uh, let's um, turn on a snort uh, snort module. Uh, uh, it's of course uh, simple. Um, we need to uh, enter uh, the Snort environment using uh, using um, the plugins, including plugin Heuristic, the new uh, the new development, uh, and of course um, indicate the configuration file which which you uh, saw um, a few seconds ago uh, and indicate uh, interface which uh, will be uh, which uh, we want to um, pro, uh, done sniffing uh, so so take uh, take network traffic and uh, show the full uh, the full information regarding to uh, scanet uh, scanet packets uh, uh, so let's enter uh, of course of course, uh, we need to uh, we need to press um, we need to press uh, password. Uh, okay, so why? Okay, we have we have some problems, uh, but it's uh, a live uh, a live demo. Uh, okay, <laughs> here it is the double dot. So again, uh, again, save uh, modification to the configuration file. 
and uh, try to enter again. So as you see, uh, we um, uh, we um, the, the snort model is uh, uh, is working, uh, including uh, heuristic uh, heuristic uh, plugin. So here here you see the heuristic uh, heuristic plugin. Okay, but nothing is happening. Uh, let's uh, let's go to the uh, to the penetration testing tool, uh, which Mike uh, presented uh, uh, a few minutes ago, uh, and try to um, and try to scan uh, and try to scan uh, 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 the server. Uh, so at the beginning, uh, let's uh, for example. Uh, Let's um, do the simple scan, just a simple scan of uh, of the tool. Uh, let's execute it, and backing to the to the snort model. As you see, nothing is happening, so we don't have any alerts. Why? Because uh, uh, the the simple scanning, the simple port scanning, usually is not um, not uh, treated as uh, the serious attacks. So um, so. Uh, however, uh, this uh, this kind of scanning is important for us, uh, for us, which that means the, the administrator or, or, or clients, because this is uh, usually the first step of uh, of the attack, the risk reconnaissance. Okay, uh, so um, so let's quit uh, from the snort and. Uh, 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 let's uh, turn on um, snort uh, work uh, snort with uh, um, with uh, signature best based, based uh, uh, detection. This is the uh, the typical approach. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, I don't remember the name. Uh, the name is uh, snort free community rules. Okay. Uh, this is the file. Uh, uh, Snort three community rules. This is the uh, file uh, which I uh, downloaded from the um, Snort uh, website, uh, and here you have a lot of uh, a lot of malware, um, uh, a lot of uh, signatures, uh, which indicates that the m some some something bad is happening uh, uh, into the OR uh, network. You see some exploits, uh, um, for example, uh, another kind of attacks. Uh, what we have uh, some uh, shell codes, uh, some malware backdoors, uh, trojans, and and so on. Okay, uh, so so let's uh, uh, so let's do the same. Uh, however, so so let's uh, enter the snort module uh, with uh, rule-based detection. Uh, Snow three community rules. Okay, uh, and we are we are right now we are sniffing. So let's prepare. Uh, let's prepare another uh, attacks. Uh, however, right now uh, we try to uh, we try to scan uh, also vulnerabilities. Uh, you remember probably like Mike uh, use it. Uh, uh, lose, use it uh, fingerprints uh, and the word list uh, rock uh, rock you. So let's execute it and back to the um, to the command line and what we are uh, what we see. Uh, we see that uh, snort working as usual intrusion detection system using signature based detection. Um, uh, detected um, a lot of attacks, a lot of um, a lot of um, attacks, for example, related uh, regarding to shell code. Uh, and what we we see, we see that the um, mm, the address IP address uh, ten eight zero seventeen is attacking or uh, or IP address or server uh, using some uh, some ports. Okay, so. Let's imagine that this uh, uh, this scanning, this typical scanning, was done was done by another um, entity from um, from, uh, for example, um, from Federal from Federation, uh, or using um, or this kind of detection was done uh, by uh, Honeypot. So we. Uh, 
collected uh, this information, uh, collected this threat intelligence, and we are able to um, provide uh, provide this um, this uh, uh, IP address to the list. Uh, to the list of malicious uh, malicious IP addresses um, uh, and enter uh, heuristic detection. So, as you remember, the IP address um, the IP address um, which was uh, source of attack was uh, ten eight. Uh, okay, wait a second. Uh, ten eight uh, zero seventeen. And right now we need to uh, put um, flags. We need to put flags. Uh, what kind of flags? The first is severity. Um, let's say that this kind of attacks was not critical, but not very low. For example, um, let's say that it's uh, it's medium. Okay, so M. Um, then, uh, what kind of attacks uh, it was? It was. Uh, Let's say that denial of service. Okay, so the flag is uh, uh, abbreviation of this kind of attack is S. Uh, what else? Uh, um, the third uh, is uh, the range. Uh, the range describes the impact of an uh, attack by uh, IP address uh, on uh, other network components uh, such as server, switches, router, or, or something like that. So uh, let's say that uh, that it's uh, it's single because uh, because the attack was um, um, uh, to the to the single uh, to the single server. Uh, and uh, the next one is access uh, flag. Access uh, uh, it means that some uh, kind of attacks requires user action. Uh, some some of attacks do not requires. For example, uh, DDoS attacks do not require uh, any uh, interaction from uh, from uh, um, end user. So we we need to put N. If we consider, I don't know, maybe uh, some uh, phishing attacks, it's such kind of attacks uh, um, needs uh, needs uh, uh, action from from user. And the last one is availability. That means uh, that some attacks, uh, for example, are ransomware cause a partial uh, cause a complete loss of access uh, to the to the entire entire data. Um, entire unit. Uh, so these kind of attacks, uh, uh, let's say that it's uh, it's uh, not uh, total but but partial. So flag P. Uh, and uh, right now we need to uh, press number of um, detected um, IP uh, packets from this uh, this IP address. At the beginning, uh, we have zero, and initial uh, entropy value. We don't have any uh, any packets, so entropy value at the beginning uh, should be uh, should be zero. Okay, so this is the the personalization of our uh, part of our um, detection uh, detection um, um, uh, detection tool. Uh, so what's uh, what's now? Uh, right now we can turn on uh, the snort. Uh, however, of course, without uh, re without um, signature based attack. So you remember it was without uh, option uh, R. Uh, so just uh, uh, just uh, um, the typical uh, typical uh, snort detection. So let's turn it uh, on and uh, do the same as previous uh, scanning uh, from um, uh, from uh, from the mic tool. Uh, okay, let's put IP address. Um, let's scan, for example, ports. Uh, uh, and do the simple scan and without uh, without uh, vulnerability scanning so just the the normal uh, the normal uh, quite normal traffic okay let's scan it and back to uh, and back to the uh, command line and as you see we have a lot of alerts 
uh, and we see uh, some interesting issues. So, of course, uh, um, source and destination IP addresses. So we have uh, um, we have uh, traffic from uh, from um, pen test tool uh, to the to the to the um, um, CISP server. Uh, it indicates that it's probably attack type S, so Daniel of service. Uh, the dangerous is M, so medium. And what is interesting, it's a value. It's, this is the final uh, value of each packet. Uh, maybe you remember what was the threshold. The threshold uh, we configured, it, it was 18.5. So uh, the final um, value is below the threshold. So we see, uh, we see um alerts and uh, what is the at the beginning we see entropy and uh, if you consider the the entropy uh the entropy is um uh decreasing because uh, the probability of uh, that the next packet will be from the same ip address is higher so the uh, the final entropy is is um, uh, decreasing if we um, pro, uh, put here the uh, Dan distributed Daniel of service, the entropy will be pro uh, will be uh, will be much higher. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, turn off uh, the snort module uh, and um, uh, and uh, maybe uh, well, we should see uh, how the scan result is uh, looking. Um, okay, uh, um, the new, uh, maybe you see the new, uh, uh, the new file. This is the, uh, this here we have uh, results of our scanning. At the beginning, uh, we see that we don't have any, uh, any, any, uh, information regarding to our uh, IP address, and uh, after that, uh, we have uh, we have information how many packets was captured, and what is the final uh, entropy value for this IP address ten eight zero seventeen. Okay. Uh, if we have uh, one additional uh, minute, um, we can also uh, we can um, personalize the um, detection uh, detection uh, algorithm. Uh, so let's uh, uh, let's open uh, uh, snort config. Let's open snort config um, file. Uh, you remember this uh, this configuration file, but um, uh, of course we can um, we can modify the f um, the value of each flag. Uh, for example, the attack flag. Um, attack flag. Uh, um, the default value is uh, five. However, we can increase it. Uh, for example. Um, uh, the default value of um, uh, of of attack flag is uh, is five uh, for um, for the distributed Daniel of service uh, uh, for the distributed for Daniel of service attack sorry uh, was um, was five so let's um, change it uh, change it to uh, to eight so uh, for example we decided to um to to detect uh, um, more in more sensitive way um this kind of attacks so let's uh, uh, let's save uh, changes and uh, and uh, turn on again or snort and uh, let's uh, uh, let's do some scanning it's 16 okay 41 and okay the same scanning as previous just a simple scan okay let's execute it and again we see uh, uh, we see um, alerts. However, maybe you remember last time we have um, value of each uh, packet um, very close to the threshold. Right now, 
uh, it's uh, it's uh, 14 or 15 uh, so it's far from the threshold so so we personalize it uh, um, the detection uh, the detection uh, algorithm um, okay I think uh, I think uh, this is all um, uh, this is all about uh, the simple demo um, which uh, which um, presents uh, the functionality of snort module uh, and of course if you have any question um, I can I can answer thank you very much Martin uh, before um, going to the question session uh, finally I mean this was the last presentation of today I've just sent to all of you the uh, an email with uh, the link to the survey, but also if you for you is more practical, I placed the link into the chat as well of this session. Um, I'm going to stay here uh, 15 minutes more, so until 12. If there are questions on the survey, if you I would like you to feel maybe maybe right now so that I can answer to you uh, immediately if there are doubts or or something is wrong whatever. Um, moreover, I'm going to share again my screen uh, with uh, uh, the outline of today, but more than the outline, what is more interesting, I guess, is uh, uh, my name and uh, my email if you want to mail me whatever whatever you think is interesting to me or to you your questions so you want to have more information about something you can just ask me directly and i i redirect you to the person that are in charge of that uh, specific topic or maybe i can reply directly to you um, I didn't mention at the, at the beginning that actually my institution is uh, Fincantieri, so we are mostly involved in ECO because we are the maritime partner, so we are more more related to providing a scenario um, linked to the mar to maritime. Um, actually, uh, one thing. Uh, before closing the presentation of March, in a sense, uh, you see that the, present, the demos were different. So the first two were more like uh, uh, related to the interface, while the second one was more hard coded. Uh, we decided to present the um, this North a prototype in a, a more coded like uh, fashion because uh, we wanted to make sure to people to understand what it was going on behind so we, we didn't just repack stuff but we definitely develop so marching actually we uh marching teams did um so that's why the presentation was quite different uh but also we, uh, that was the purpose i mean we really wanted to show you what what was going on behind also because you understood that all the uh, steps that marching perform could be automatized like very easily, uh, but we did that by hands in order to really give you the flavor of what was going on. So uh, again, I'm going to stay here 15 more minutes uh, if you have any question and also if you have question for marching. So thank you very much for attending uh, today and uh, if you have question just speak up. Thank you, Emmanuel, for her clarification. Um, maybe to avoid uh, silence, uh, I can say a few words regarding to free, um, further steps of uh, Snort model. Um, we are uh, working on a machine learning functionality uh, to deploy. Um, it, it can be, we believe that it can be uh, additional and then additional functionality of snort module um, and then the power of this uh, this tool uh, will be uh, will be uh, it, it will be more powerful uh, more powerful tool and of course um, uh, it will be interesting from a uh, research point of view because as you see as you know uh, AGH is university so we are focusing mainly on the uh, on, on science on developing uh, 
uh, solutions uh, and new solutions. Thank you. Yes, Jose, do you do you have any question uh, to me? Yes, it's a general question. It probably is more for the three system. In the in your demo or in the second demo, we have seen how we have uh, attacked the the CISP uh, server that currently, as uh, Manuel explained, is just uh, containing fake data for the sake of this uh, demo. Uh, my um, in this and um, in the pen test, we saw some advices on some potential vulnerabilities. So my question was, was first, if those vulnerabilities were really serious. And second, uh, what would be needed in order to to really host real data in CISP in a in a safe way, in a confident way? So, if you have something, Martin, because uh, you were the last to talk, but uh, otherwise, maybe Mike or or mm -hmm. even Peter. So maybe um, I I start uh, answering. Uh, as you saw, um, Snort uh, equipped by uh, typical rules, the signature of attacks indicated that it's uh, it was serious. That's mean uh, vulnerability scanning. Uh, it's um, it's a serious uh, attack because uh, we are able to exploit some vulnerabilities. Uh, and that's in, in this way, um, and for example, um, take uh, the, the, the shell code, uh, the, the command line and uh, install some mal malware. Uh, so uh, for sure, uh, the vulnerability scanning, um, it's, uh, it's serious. Um, however, also the uh, simple scanning of ports, if it's uh, closed or open, it's uh, the first. In fact, it's the first uh, step of uh, um, of of each attack uh, because uh, an attacker needs to uh, prepare uh, reconnaissance and and, uh, and um, know uh, as much as as uh, he or she um, can about uh, the target of uh, of attack. Maybe Mike uh, will will continue <laughs> my uh, my thoughts. Uh, well, I completely agree with you. Uh, as you said, the, the an attacker, uh, let's say that we have uh, a web application, an attacker, the first the first uh, thing that an attacker will do is to scan and identify open ports, and then move on on more complex uh, attacks and uh, exploits. So. Uh, I think that uh, this is a very, a very serious. Uh, the first, uh, the first reconnaissance phase is a very serious phase, and we need to focus on it. Uh, so I think that uh, Snort uh, will uh, provide uh, a, a layer of security on this reconnaissance phase. So yes. So summarizing, you could say that the. Uh, with a pen test, let's say to, to see that your server first is checking, of course, your own vulnerabilities and then uh, monitoring tool to see if you are being, let's say, investigated could be a good confidence to really put the real data in the in the internet. Yes, exactly. In order to see what passes through the firewall and to see what uh, what vulnerabilities your application has. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Um, one other thing, more uh, less technical, let's say, uh, for the participants. Um, this is the first workshop. We are going to have other two workshops in the future. One that is going to be uh, in the last days of May and, uh, and another one on the following month. Uh, the the presentation is going to be let's say quite similar in terms of the structure, in a sense that we are going to present other free prototypes. Uh, so and so in the end we are going to present nine prototypes. We are going to uh, send an invitation uh, to you as uh, as it was for this one. Uh, we hoped that you like the workshop of today and uh, 
of course, uh, we hope to see you in the next uh, in the next workshops. Uh, so in in a couple, let's say in a couple of weeks, maybe we are going to send you the invitation for the following one, and uh, and yes. So uh, guys, okay, uh, the it's uh, five to twelve. Mm, I think uh, actually mm, there is no need then to uh, stay more in the room. Uh, I ask you really to all the participants to fill the survey uh, and uh, I ask you also to do it uh, within this week if you're not doing it right now uh, because uh, you know when you are fresher with uh, with the memories it's better your feedback is more accurate and more, more, moreover it's easier for us to uh, collect all the data and uh, think to the next uh, to the next um, workshop of course so if there are no other points i declare the session con uh, conclude finished sorry okay so uh again thank you very much to all the presenters thank you very much to all the participants and uh see you soon <laughs>